In this video, we want to talk about the outlook and the forecast of what will happen with the climate within the next years, decades, and even centuries. And what we need to, to do this prognosis is um, that we use climate models, so computer simulations, which uh, use uh, different physical laws to predict uh, the future. Um, of course, what you can do is uh, you can compare the different uh, computer models which are used to predict the future, um, to uh, check the accuracy of these uh, models. So that's the Climate Model Comparison Project, CMIP5. Um, this is uh, made to support the IPCC um, to um, compare the different uh, climate models uh, to, to prove that they are right. So uh, what is done uh, on the one end, of course, uh, the models must be able to reproduce the measurements uh, from the historical period from 1850 to 2005. Um, and then, of course, uh, it, it, the models must be able to project up to 2100 and even to 2300 in different scenarios, which are defined um, to reduce the amount of different uh, scenarios. Uh, of course, uh, there are decadal climate predictions uh, in order to, to be able to, to uh, synthesize the, the results. Uh, one issue, of course, is the role of the carbon cycle in climate change. Uh, you've seen this in the previous video that uh, the carbon cycle is uh, disturbed by or disturbed by human activity. Uh, so we have an increase of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases uh, in the atmosphere, and of course that uh, is uh, under investigation. And finally, of course, uh, the models are also able to go even far more back in time so that uh, uh, they can reproduce what has happened in the years 850 to 1850 uh, or even uh, back to the last glacial maximum. Um, this is important to, to do in order to check the quality of the computer models and if they are able to even repeat, reproduce single events like volcanoes or other sources of aerosols in the atmosphere, so that's a good way to, to check the quality of these models. This flowchart shows the Earth's system model for climate simulation, uh, which is of course in a simplified way um, the concept how to uh, couple the different parts of Earth's system. What you can see in, um, in blue, that's uh, the uh, atmospheric model. Uh, with a horizontal resolution of about 200 kilometers with uh, 47 layers, so that you have uh, uh, small layers uh, which uh, describe um, all the effects in the atmosphere. Uh, and what you can see is the arrows represent the exchange of uh, components or energy. There's on the one, of course, an exchange of energy and impulse with the land biosphere uh, model, so that's an interactive vegetation model. Um, with an horizontal resolution which is analog uh, to the atmosphere. Uh, of course, we have also an exchange of water, so we have water vapor in the atmosphere, so there's an exchange between the biosphere model and the water model. Uh, on the other hand, we have the ocean, so there are two different uh, models uh, to describe the oceans. On the one hand, we have the ocean model uh, with a variable horizontal resolution, uh, and uh, with a different amount of, of, of layers. And on the other hand, we have a, the global biochemical ocean model, which is separated. Um, and both models are again in interaction with the other, uh, other sub models. So there is an exchange uh, with, the, with the atmosphere, of course, with an exchange of water with the biosphere model and again with the, with the uh, uh, atmospheric model. And there's a a uh, separate layer um, to couple the, the uh, information, to couple uh, all the data between the atmosphere um, and the ocean. So you see that's uh, a rather simplified uh, description of uh, how this, uh, how climate simulations go on uh, on, on supercomputers. 
Uh, of course, we have a very small grid, which is uh, getting smaller and smaller. You need small time steps to describe what, what's happening as the, in particular, the atmosphere is, is always in, in flow. And uh, in order to be able to predict the future, then you need a small time scale and small um, spatial resolution um, to predict the future. Or, of course, in order to uh, check the quality of these simulations to, to prove uh, what has happened back in time uh, and that the predictions uh, fit uh, to the current measurements. And what you can see is that the prediction quality of climate change models or climate change uh, simulations are very very accurate they can uh, reproduce uh, all the measurements of uh, the global temperature of uh, the carbon dioxide concentration etc under different circumstances with a very high quality in order to reduce the complexity of the simulations and that you are able to compare the different uh, climate change uh, simulations. Um, the IPCC has defined four different pathways uh, called the representative concentration pathways. So these pathways are a trajectory um, of the greenhouse gas concentration uh, of uh, in the atmosphere. It's not the emissions, just the uh, the concentration. Um, and uh, what is done on the, on the one hand is that there are two different periods. On the one hand, we have the period in back in time, 1860 to 2005, so um, that these pathways reproduce uh, the greenhouse gas concentration, uh, which has been observed in the past. And then we have the period uh, with a forecast to the medium term future until the end of the century. Um, and uh, these four pathways, of course, need to consider different uh, outlooks on the one and of course, what's about the population development, uh, what's about the uh, development of the energy production, and will uh, mankind rely on, on, on fossil fuels, uh, which type of fossil fuel will there be a transformation to uh, renewables, uh, regarding the electricity production, uh, the, the heat production, and of course, uh, in, in the transportation sector. And of course, uh, what is also considered uh, in these pathways, uh, the food production and the land use. Um, so what's about the, the, the forests, the rainforest uh, in particular. Um, and this information or this prognosis will be used uh, to predict the emission and to derive uh, the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere within the next decades and until the end of the century. Um, and then you can use this uh, RCPs, these representative concentration pathways in your uh, computer simulations um, and compare the results of these uh, simulations. You can see on this slide the four different representative concentration pathways. Um, the first one called RCP 2.6, that is the emission path which represents a scenario with a very low greenhouse gas concentration until the end of this uh, century. Uh, the radiative forcing will reach a value of 3.1 watts per square meter in 2050 and then finally uh, will drop until the end of the century to 2.6 watts per square meter. Um, so that's the reason or that, that the way uh, to, to label these RCPs that you, you talk about the uh, radiative forcing 6.2, that, that's the label of this pathway. Um, in order to achieve this, these values, uh, we need to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions significantly. Uh, and finally, we will get a CO2 concentration of 490 ppm until the end of this century. Uh, second pathway is RCP 4.5. So um, that means that we would have a, a radiative forcing of 4.5 watts per square meter until the end of this century. Um, so this means that we will implement uh, several uh, technologies, uh, strategies and even policies to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions. But finally what we will have is at the end of this century a uh, CO2 concentration of 650 ppm. So we'll have uh, an increase of the CO2 concentration compared to the situation we are facing now uh, from 400 and about 10 ppm to 650. 
the next pathway, RCP 6.0, gives us um, the situation with the radiative forcing of 6.0 watts per square meter. Um, so this this pathway, um, yeah, is that we won't do a lot of uh, policies over that we can do a lot of uh, implement a lot of uh, technologies and strategies to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that we will still rely on fossil fuels in the energy system and that will give us a co2 concentration of uh, 850 ppm um, and this of course will result in a significant decrease of uh, of the global temperature and finally uh, the rcp 8.1 that's the fourth pathway uh, with a radiative forcing of 8.5 watts per square meter, so an additional radiation, an additional force um, in the climate system uh, that will increase the temperature. Um, so there will be no uh, no technology which will be implemented. We will, there will be no change in habits, uh, no change of policies uh, to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, until the end of this century, and that finally will um, lead to a CO2 concentration of 1,370 ppm at the end of this century. What are the driving forces of the four different representative concentration pathways? In this flowchart, you see four groups of uh, driving forces, which finally lead to a change of the radiative forcing. So on the one hand, we have uh, information or we need information of population and the gross domestic domestic product gdp um, so we need a prognosis um, for all pathways how will the population on earth will develop what's about the gdp of the different countries and overall uh, for the whole uh, planet uh, and this uh, outlook will be used uh, in the computer simulations uh, to predict uh, or do, do a prognosis for the greenhouse gas emissions finally. Second uh, group uh, is the use of energy. So what's the primary energy consumption? Uh, will the consumption uh, increase or decrease due to um, more efficient technologies which are in use? Uh, what's uh, in particular about the oil consumption as oil is one of the main uh, fossil sources which is, is used globally. In particular, of course, in the transportation sector, but also in all other sectors, um, and of course in manufacturing processes. And finally, how will the primary energy mix look like? Will we rely on coal uh, power plants and natural gas power plants, or will there be a transformation to wind turbines, photovoltaics, concentrated solar power, hydropower, etc.? Um, on the other hand, we have uh, the change of land use. So how will vegetation change within the next decades until the end of this century? What's about the cropland use? Uh, will there be a change of cropland use? Uh, of course, mainly to, to, for food production and to feed the, the people. And finally, um, we will use information about the grassland. And again, this gives us information and an outlook uh, for the uh, greenhouse gas emissions and the last group is uh, about the energy intensity so what's about uh, the, the, the efficiency uh, of uh, the energy system uh, regarding the production and the consumption and of course the carbon factor and all these uh, four groups um, change the greenhouse gas emissions so we can make a prediction about the greenhouse gas emissions then we can derive the atmospheric uh, air pollutants uh, and this uh, gives us a prediction of the concentration of greenhouse gases, the concentration of the air pollutants um, regarding, for example, also cloud coverage, etc. So uh, this is, of course, also included in the climate simulations. What is the influence of the clouds and they have a positive and a negative feedback on the climate system. And finally, uh, we get uh, new values for the rate of forcing within the next uh, years, decades, until the end of the century. And we can derive uh, the change of the temperature uh, and the development of the uh, um, global warming. On this slide, you see uh, the first result of these um, computer simulations and the outlook um, coming from the four different representative 
pathways. So here at top, you see the four pathways in, in different colors. Uh, we have this uh, RCP 2.6 um, in red, 4.5 in black, that's uh, RCP 6.0. And finally, the RPC 8.5, so highest uh, radiative forcing at the end of the century. And first of all, under consideration of uh, the given input parameters, population, energy intensity, energy mix, uh, primary energy consumption, etc., uh, what we get is uh, a prognosis of the CO2 emissions uh, in, in billion tons of carbon per year. Um, so what you see on the x-axis, you see the years um, until the end of this century. And what we get is, or what we would need to do is uh, to, to fulfill the agreement of uh, Paris so that we can um, reach our goal to have an increase of global temperature of 1.5 degrees Celsius until the end of this century compared to the pre-industrial uh, period, um, we need to get to the green uh, pathway so that we will reduce our annual emissions um, so we are on a higher level and you see we need to get on a low level and uh, until the end of the century we need even have a small negative value so that we have a re reduction of uh, emissions and finally well, that we can um, use carbon dioxide. So in, at, at least 2080 we must uh, have a net uh, zero emission of, of greenhouse gases. On the other hand, uh, if uh, we are on the other pathways, you see in red or even in, in black, we have an increase and then there will be a, a decrease or decline of uh, CO2 emissions, but still there will be emissions which lead to an or will lead to an increase of, of uh, the global temperature. And finally, uh, what will happen on the uh, blue pathway um, you see we have this in continuous increase and just at the end of the century we will have a flatten of this curve that we will reach a upper limit of about 100 uh, billion tons of carbon uh, emission per year. So that of course uh, will result in a significant increase of the global temperature. The carbon dioxide concentration until the end of this century uh, can be seen on this uh, diagram. So again we have uh, the time on the x-axis and then the carbon dioxide concentration in ppm on the y-axis so we are at the moment at uh, about 400 410 uh, ppm and then you see the four different uh, rcps uh, in green that's the pathway with a significant reduction of uh, greenhouse gas emissions within the next decade so that uh, finally we will uh, can reduce our um, emissions and that we can uh, reduce or that we can keep on a low uh, co2 concentration level um, on the other hand of course what you see is in red black and of course also in, in blue uh, with a significant increase of the carbon dioxide concentration due to an increase of the uh, co2 emissions uh, the red and uh, the black curve so rcp 4.5 and rcp 6.0 uh, you see uh, again a flatten of the curve so that the concentration keeps on a higher level uh, and that of course will in add radiative forcing and uh, will give us a higher uh, temperature uh, within the next years and decades. On this figure you can see the outlook uh, of the radiative forcing by 2100. So on the y-axis you see the radiative forcing in watts per square meter and again we have our four different um, RCPs uh, and what you can see is uh, how the uh, the radiative forcing will change within the next years and decades. So the green curve gives us the RCP 2.6 with a um, slight increase and then a decrease due to the significant reduction of greenhouse gas emissions that we will uh, get in radiative forcing of 2.6 in, in the year 2100. Uh, and of course the other representative pathways show an increase uh, of the radiative forcing so the additional force which drives uh, the climate and will lead to an additional increase of uh, temperature uh, what you have to keep in mind is that uh, the climate is um, it cannot react that fast to uh, change conditions so there will be a delay um, 
of reaction. So if we would stop uh, greenhouse gas emissions right now, totally, uh, it will take some years until we will observe the positive effects uh, of the uh, of the concentration of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and then uh, a decline of the temperature and that can be even seen in the on the, this green pathway that we have still an increase of radiative forcing until uh, nearly uh, three watts per square meter and then this reduction um, to uh, 2.8 uh, watts per square meter in accordance uh, to the different uh, representative concentration pathways uh, we can have a look at the future greenhouse gas emission scenarios which can be separated and analyzed uh, in this case what we have is we have four different scenarios um, on the one hand what will happen if there wouldn't be any uh, climate policy so then you can uh, do this uh, projection future emissions um, and uh, you are on this RCP uh, 5.8, so an increase of the radiative uh, forcing uh, until the end of this century that will give us an uh, increase of the um, t global temperature of uh, 4.1 up to 4.8 degrees Celsius by 2100, so that the mean global temperature will increase about four to even five degrees Celsius. Then uh, the next uh, scenario is the current climate policy. So if the countries would rely on their policies which have been defined, then we uh, will have a projected temperature increase by uh, 2100 of let's say 3.1 to 3.7 degrees Celsius. So still a significant increase. Um, if all countries would uh, achieve their current goals, so the, the countries have uh, set different uh, climate uh, mitigation goals until the end of the century, um, beginning uh, in Rio de Janeiro, in Kyoto, and of course then this Paris Agreement. Um, and if all countries would achieve the current goals, then we will have um, a mean temperature increase by 2100 to be between 2.6 and even 3.2 uh, degrees Celsius. So we wouldn't uh, be able to uh, achieve our goal that we will limit the global warming by two degrees Celsius. Um, so that's important to know that the current uh, policies, the goals, the commitments will not uh, sufficient to achieve the goal of this Paris Agreement to limit the global warming to two degrees Celsius. And then we have two pathways on the one and the two degrees pathway that we will uh, limit the global warming to two degrees compared to the conditions uh, before 1750 um, that needs a significant decrease of greenhouse gas emissions to reach this commitment um, under the Paris Agreement uh, so that is does so it we need more commitments more policies um, than we have uh, defined at the moment and then Finally, uh, the fifth scenario is the 1.5 degrees Celsius pathway. So uh, we want to limit the average temperature increase uh, to 1.5 degrees Celsius by 2100 uh, compared to the pre-industrial condition. And that, of course, means a rapid reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Um, uh, this is necessary to achieve uh, this goal until the end of, of this century. If you take this five future greenhouse gas emission scenarios, we can have a look at the annual emissions of carbon dioxide equivalents in billion tons. So this diagram shows you what will happen until the end of this century. The different colors represent the upper and lower limit uh, within these uh, scenarios. So in red, what you can see is that the pathway we are observing or the scenario uh, with no climate uh, policies, uh, which will uh, result in an increase of the global temperature of 4.8 uh, or lower limit 4.1 degrees Celsius. So um, if we would be on this pathway with the RCP of 8.5, we will get or we will be on this pathway, we will have this 
uh, bandwidth of emissions uh, and of course uh, we are achieving or will this will result in an increase of four to five degrees celsius uh, higher temperature until the end of this century uh, second scenario in in yellow um, so the current policies scenario uh, you can see the, the yellow curve so we are within this band of the annual emissions of uh, co2 equivalents so somewhere here and that will give uh, give us an increase of the global temperature of 3.1 to 3.7 degrees celsius if we would uh, commit to all the policies uh, and achieve our goals we have defined at the moment um, you see that the annual emissions uh, of co2 equivalents will rise and then we will get back uh, or then we will reduce these emissions um, Still, we will get a temperature increase of 2.6 and uh, up to 3.2 degrees Celsius. So we would be somewhere on this uh, in this bandwidth uh, of um, getting coming from the outlook of this uh, climate change computer simulations. Um, so that's not sufficient to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement. And then finally, what you see in blue and in green, these are the two pathways of 2 degrees in blue and 1.5 degrees Celsius in, in green. So you see the upper limit and lower limit and the uh, dotted line gives us the median. So um, we need to reduce our uh, greenhouse gas emissions significantly. In, in blue, you see that's the pathway we need to go to um, re limit the... Uh, temperature increase of uh, or the, the, that we can uh, keep to this temperature increase of two degrees Celsius until uh, we reach, we reach uh, the year 2100. Um, so there must be a significant um, a decrease of um, of emissions. And if you want to achieve even the um, goal that the global warming is limited to 1.5 degrees Celsius until. Uh, the year 2100 you see this in, in, in green we need to go on this pathway here um, and even we will have a negative emission so that we need to to reduce the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere um, so that we have a net negative uh, emission um, and that's the only way to achieve this uh, 1.5 degrees uh, celsius limit in this table you see uh, what will happen uh, under the different scenarios so the information is taken from the global carbon atlas and the information about the outreach or the outlook uh, until the end of the century so what you can see we have again four different scenarios uh, with a different uh, co2 concentration of 400 500 700 and even 900 ppm and you see the global warming uh, so the range of the prognosis uh, regarding the temperature increase and then you see the effects um, in the oceans on the land and in the atmosphere so that uh, so what will happen with in the next uh, years and decades uh, if we are on the one of these uh, of these pathways so um, if we would be on this pathway that we have an, a co2 concentration of 400 ppm until the end of this century this will give us an, an increase of the temperature of uh, one up to 2.3 degrees celsius so uh, although we will need to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions rapidly uh, there will still be a sea level rise by 0.3 up to 0.5 meters globally uh, there will be a long-term degradation of the coral reefs and the arctic sea ice extent in september will be 40 percent smaller compared to the um, situation or the condition we have today on land we'll have a, a shrink of the permafrost um, in particular in, in siberia and northern part of russia um, and a reduction of major crop yields to, due to the higher uh, temperatures and to probably more heat waves, more droughts, which, which will occur. And finally, in the atmosphere, we have increased intensity and duration of these heat waves. Uh, we'll have uh, more often and higher intensity of heavy precipitations. Um, and of course, the existing rainfall patterns will uh, intensify in all regions. And what you can see now, in the different scenarios uh, what will happen so the sea level uh, rise will slightly change uh, also uh, there will be a long-term degradation of the coral leaves 
um, the Arctic ice extent will reduce or even uh, under the fourth uh, on the fourth scenario there will be a ice free Arctic summer by 2050. Uh, on land, of course, there will be an increase of the permafrost shrink, uh, which uh, will release uh, frozen methane in particular. Um, and of course, we, have an, we will have a significant reduction of major crop yields. Um, and at some point, there will be even a re reduction of the um, carbon dioxide absorption by plants. So if the CO2 concentration will increase, uh, plants won't be able to um, absorb uh, more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere so that uh, plants won't help that much to reduce the CO2 concentration. Um, and of course, what will happen uh, if the temperature will increase that fast that there will be a rapid extinction of, of species. Um, so they will be lost forever. And finally, regarding the atmosphere, uh, the intensity and the duration of heat waves of droughts will increase. Uh, even uh, the heavy or even extreme precipitation, uh, like hurricanes, typhoons, for example, will occur more often, will be more powerful due to an increase of uh, the, the temperature of the atmosphere, the higher temperature of the oceans, so that we have more water vapor. Uh, in the atmosphere, the uh, higher temperature of the atmosphere can store more energy, so more water vapor, so the uh, hurricanes, the typhoons uh, will get more powerful. Um, and finally, that will give us, of course, a significant increase of costs uh, due to uh, damage uh, coming from these uh, extreme weather events. So what do we need to do uh, within the next year is what you see on this slide are the annual greenhouse gas emissions in billion tons. So you see what has happened in the past in green beginning in 1850 and then this um, increase of the greenhouse gas emissions until now. Um, and if you want to limit our um, uh, the, the global warming to 1.5 degrees by 2100, we can uh, calculate the remaining emission budget. So we know uh, or we can derive uh, what are or what is the greenhouse gas concentration in the atmosphere? What's the situation today? And uh, then we can derive uh, what is the remaining emission we have uh, until uh, we get uh, step over this tipping point, um, and that this uh, CO two concentration will lead to an increase of radiative forcing, and then of course will increase the global temperature above this 1.5 or this 2 degrees Celsius limit. So what you see is uh, if we want to achieve this 1.5 degrees Celsius goal, uh, we have a remaining emission budget of 420 gigatons of carbon dioxide related to values um, on the 1st of January 2018. So keep in mind there are two additional years with an annual emission of uh, 30 to uh, 35 uh, billion tons of, of carbon dioxide. So this, this uh, remaining budget had re has reduced within the last two years uh, from uh, 420 gigatons uh, down to, let's say, 350, 360 gigatons of carbon dioxide as we haven't um, reduced the CO2 emissions. If you would, uh, if you want to, to get this or to achieve this two degrees Celsius goal until the end of this uh, century. We have a remaining emission budget of 1,170 gigatons carbon dioxide. And what you can see on this uh, figure is uh, what are the pathways we would need to go on or would we have gone to uh, to achieve this, this goal uh, regarding the remaining emission budget you see beginning in the year 2000. We would have or needed to go on this pathway. So and still a significant decrease but the velocity or the, the change is, is not that uh, hard and then we would have be able to achieve this 1.5 degrees celsius limit um, at the moment we are uh, somewhere here so we have this uh, greenhouse gas emissions of 40 uh, gigatons per year and then in order to be able to achieve the scale of uh, this goal and uh, rely on this remaining emission budget, we need to significantly decrease our emission within the next uh, two, three, five years. Otherwise, we won't be able to achieve this, this goal, which has been defined in the Paris Agreement. 
Um, and even if you say, okay, let's let's keep to this two degrees Celsius goal, um, we need to reduce the carbon dioxide concentrations globally rapidly. And this table shows the components in the Earth system that have been proposed in the scientific literature as potentially being susceptible uh, to abrupt or irreversible change. So this table is taken from the IPCC climate change report uh, 2013. What you can see in this table uh, in the first column, the different components of the climate system, and then if they are potentially abrupt, um, the irreversibility of uh, the forcing, if this is reversible, and then we have the projected likelihood, and finally, um, the confidence we have from the scientific point of view. So, for example, let's start with the uh, Atlantic meridional overturning uh, circulation. So, um, that this might collapse, that might be, or that can be potentially abrupt. Um, this irreversibility is, is unknown, so we don't know if this is uh, reversible or what is the uh, time scale. Um, of course, it's very unlikely that the uh, Atlantic MOC will undergo a rapid uh, transition. That we have a high, we have a high confidence in this. And you see all the other issues like ice sheet, the permafrost, carbon release, the cloth rate, methane release. Um, that is irreversible for millennia. So it will take thousands of years until to go come back to the state we have had in the pre-industrial age. Um, of course, this uh, you see we have a high confidence uh, in this ice sheet and cloth rate uh, methane release. Um, it's um, yeah, it's very unlikely or exceptionally unlikely, but we have this um, this this change. Um, on the other hand, you see the tropical forest, the boreal forest uh, that also might be potential uh, abrupt. We have. Uh, irreversible of forcing within uh, centuries. Uh, and finally, uh, the summer Arctic sea ice, the long term droughts, and the monsoonal circulation that might also, uh, that, that is irreversible for decades. Uh, we have a likelihood uh, projected uh, of this summer Arctic sea ice uh, that th this will disappear uh, with, a, with a medium or even a low, low confidence. So, there will be a significant change in these uh, in the different components and that will have an influence on the climate system on earth this global map uh, shows the potential tipping cascades in the climate system what you see the different colors um, of these rectangles uh, represent the uh, temperatures so that we are in, in, in yellow uh, that might occur if the temperature will increase uh, from 1 to 3 degrees Celsius in orange uh, from 3 to 5 and if the temperature increase would, in, uh, would be larger than 5 degrees Celsius then we would uh, have these uh, tipping, or the, this tipping point, uh, the change of the, the component in the Earth climate system um, so if the temperature is larger than 5 degrees Celsius. And what you see is here in, in yellow, so the Alpine glaciers will be um, vanished. We have this Arctic summer ice sea, which will be reduced, the Greenland ice sheet. Um, the, the coral reefs, on the other hand, would, will uh, disappear. Um, and you see the, um, the cascades or the connection between the different um, systems or the different components that uh, Arctic summer ice, uh, sea ice, which will vanish, um, will have an influence on the Greenland ice sheet. And that, of course, uh, influences also other um, types in the other components in the climate system. Um, so if we won't be able to limit uh, the temperature increase to 3 or, or even 5 degrees Celsius, so if we would be uh, on the uh, RCP pathway at least 8.5, uh, we will observe uh, significant changes uh, regarding this orange marked uh, components so that the jet stream will uh, change significantly. We can observe this uh, even today. Uh, due to the change in the Arctic summer sea ice that, that is influencing the jet stream so that the, we get more stable weather conditions in, in northern and central Europe. We've seen this in the past with the long term of heat waves or uh, uh, droughts or less precipitation in, 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 in Europe in the last uh, years. Um, then, of course, uh, we have um, 
an influence or change in the thermal haline circulation, the Amazon rainforest, and of course El Nino. Um, they will influence each other, and if one of these components will tip so that we have an irreversible change, then this will influence significantly other components and uh, reduces, uh, or we, we, we have an increase of the temperature, we have a significant change of, uh, of the nature in, in this region, and of course this will also influence the population in this region due to uh, extreme weather events which might uh, occur. Finally, we'll have a look at the radiative forcing and the carbon dioxide concentration by 2300. So the, um, the long-term prognosis uh, based on the four different uh, RCP pathways we have. So you see this uh, RCP and then the extent, uh, extended concentration pathways. Um, so what are or what will be the carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere until uh, the year 2300 and what will be the rate of forcing, so uh, the driver of the temperature increase, see in green, that would be the pathway we need to get onto uh, to uh, limit the global warming um, to uh, re in, in accordance to the per Paris Agreement. Uh, so you see the rate of forcing where we have the maximum um, in the year 2000, uh, uh, 2030 and then we have a slight decrease, a slow decrease in the rate of forcing due to no greenhouse gas emissions. So we have stopped uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 2100 and we need to, uh, and then you see this small de decrease of the rate of forcing so that this will stop uh, the global warming we need to go onto this pathway and um, if we are on the different or on, on the other pathways the the red one the black one or the blue one you'll see this um, continuous increase of carbon dioxide concentration um, and of course an increase of the radiative forcing and of course if if we would keep on this blue curve uh, that would result in a severe change of the global system if the radiative forcing would be at 12 watts per square meter with a rapid and significant increase of the global temperature and a change of the Earth system. So overall you see uh, that the climate um, simulation models um, can help us to understand what to do, which policies we need, which commitments we we need, and we know what we need to do. Um, this is very well understood as the accuracy of these models uh, is very high, and uh, even the the complexity, of course, is getting uh, larger. More um, components can be included, are better understood, like the influence of clouds, of aerosols, etc. Um, and that gives us an, an, a tool to uh, define our goals, to define our commitments, uh, that we can reduce the greenhouse gas emissions and we need to do this rapidly um, in order to achieve our goal that we can limit the global warming to 1.5 or even to 2 degrees Celsius.